Jewish um, Yes, so the question has to do with the contents of the other ID number fields. Some of them start out with uh, three capital letters and then followed by a dash and numbers and other ones have the whole thing written out such as specimen B1171. The reason is that they're putting any other number they have in this field. The ones that start out with the three letters followed by a dash, followed by a number, almost always those are the collector number and the letters are the initials of the names of the collector. So I can show that, I can, I can explore whether that is the case. They, they decided they can put whatever they want in there, which is what makes it difficult for us to say those should be collector numbers. Because sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Okay? I'll go and look at an example. So here is an example of what Yvette is talking about. In one case, actually let me expand the field next to it also. Here's an example where another ID number said specimen number B708. We don't know what that means or what it applies to. And then we have examples like this one and this one and this one and this one where the, there are three letters followed by the digits. Now, if we look at the preparators, there's an interesting pattern. DAL is probably DA Lancaster. So this is the preparator's number in this case. But here, GEH, well, that's not Diana Finley's number. This is probably one of the collector's numbers. Let's go look at the collector for this one. GEH. Uh huh. George E. Hudson. So in this case, it was a collector's number in other ID number one and a preparator number in other ID number two. So they're mixing numbers. They're numbers everywhere. And we can't say always that they're collector numbers. That's why I was forced to put them in the other catalog numbers field. Okay. So Back to my mapping of the original data to Darwin Core. Here I have an institution ID field. Remember I said that the ID fields are always some kind of a global unique identifier. Whereas the other fields like institution code and collection code are usually human readable strings. They, these make sense to humans. This makes sense to a computer. So it turns out that this collection at the Connor Museum the bird collection is part of an institution that's been registered somewhere. In this case, it's been registered with the BioCollections database. It's a database that has information about all kinds of collections. And that's the number where it is registered there. And that number is globally, globally unique. With this number, I can go look up everything I want to know about that collection. With these two pieces of information, I can't. That's why the IDs can be so useful. And that's why the IDs benefit from being globally unique. Okay? So we as humans, we don't recognize that. It doesn't make any sense to us. This is the part that makes sense to us. But the computers like that one. Oops. I filled in the basis of record. They're all preserved specimens. The original database didn't have that, but it was easy enough for me to do. And then here, 
is what I really wanted to get to was how did the dynamic properties look. This collection was interesting in that they had plenty of different kinds of measurements and they wanted to share those measurements. Not all collections do, but this collection did. They wanted all their information out there. And so I constructed the dynamic properties from all of the measurements that there were, plus a verbatim scientific name. <coughs> now why did I do that? Because in this collection there were some hybrids. And a hybrid name is not a valid scientific name. It's a valid identification name that tells you a couple of different scientific names and a formula for how to put them together, but it's not a valid scientific name. So I should not put that hybrid in the scientific name field. Instead, I put it in dynamic properties under a verbatim scientific name that gave me the entire formula for the hybrid. And then if I go and look in the scientific name field, I should find out the most specific actual scientific name that could be used. And those are all the way over at the right. Scientific name. I'm going to do a little trick and drag this all the way over by the other one so we can see it, to see them together. One moment. Okay, so in this case, the scientific name that was applied was not the genus or species of either of the hybrids. It was the next higher part of the classification that contained both of them, which in this case was the family. So the best I can do for a scientific name for that record is the family. But I need to tell you that it was identified to be this hybrid as well. Another example is here where the verbatim scientific name that was given was a genus plus a designation that it was some species we don't know. Anus spa. So the scientific name was the most specific scientific name we could apply which was the genus name. And the species is not known. Does that make sense? So you can see that I'm being very, very detailed and specific about how my Darwin core fields are populated. Because I don't want to mix concepts. When people get these data, I want them to be assured that it's not an interpretation, that it's filled with the meaning that is meant for that Darwin core field. So that's enough of a review of what I did to it, but you can get the idea that there was plenty of work involved. It wasn't an easy thing. It wasn't even just a simple mapping from one field to another. I have to do all kinds of things to make those data into Darwin Core data and to try and fill in as many fields as I can from the original. Any questions? Okay. There is a question. There is a question. Um, I'd like to know if there's a way of measuring with any data that you might have how much of the fields, what percentage of the fields would make um, the data useful? Because uh, obviously from what I'm getting, you have to manipulate the, the, the data to 
fill as many fields as possible but how much of that makes it uh, usable as an example or uh, uh, to paraphrase is it worth it <laughs> um, okay, it's, it's difficult to, to answer the question as stated my perspective is that everything that I can do to add to the data helps as long as I don't misrepresent and do it incorrectly. Everything I add can be useful. But to quantify how useful really depends on who's using it and what their question is. For many, it won't make any difference if it was a preserved specimen or an observation. But for most, it will because they want to go to a collection and see it. They want it in their hands to do something with, to identify it, to get a piece from it, to measure something. And they can't do that from an observation. So if I don't tell them it's an observation, they go looking for, for a specimen that doesn't exist. That's a simple example. At a very practical level, I'm an ornithologist, remember, those measurements, except for body mass, we generally consider that those are uh, person specific. So how I measure a wing, and how John measures a wing, and how Yvette might measure that wing, will get consistent differences just because we have different concepts of where you measure to where. So I would generally say that measurements other than body mass not worth serving in the database because I want people to do those measurements themselves. But that's a very bird specific thing. I would say that that information is never going to be used. Best guess. Or maybe that would come back to the standards that you were saying. Uh, you say there's something that is out for, for the um, herbarium specimens. Probably maybe that would come back to people standardizing what they want out there for a specific. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. That it would be a very useful exercise for every community to have something like the Apple Core, which makes recommendations about exactly what to do and what not to do across the entire Darwin Core. That would be very, very useful. I agree. And I would say that such activity would go appropriately to a committee in some kind of a taxonomic working group, taxonomic society, at whatever level they, they organize naturally, like bird organizations or mammal organizations. Good question. Any others? Yes, one second. <laughs> My question is uh, for this database. I want to know the, but because I see in this uh, colon, that colon there, the, uh, the colon of a scientific name, we will put only the, the genus. But the scientific name must be a genus and a uh, epithet, a species way. No. No, it doesn't. <coughs> it needs, if we look at the definition, the definition says it should be the most specific scientific name to which the specimen can be determined. Right? So if we only know the family, mm -hmm. then the scientific name should be populated by the family. But if we know